thank you very much, Kathy and Terry, for inviting me to speak with you today. And uh, I wanted to uh, really call attention to what a wonderful thing Kathy and Terry and uh, Carol Krukoff and the people in the public education section have done by uh, creating this series. I think it really epitomizes the very best in, in what the Oriental Institute has to offer, that it gives uh, a venue to talk about pretty complex issues and it really pushes us as the, uh, the researchers to communicate our interests and our work in a way that is actually going to be comprehensible, or should be. I'll have to check with you afterwards on that one. Um, but obviously, economies are an extremely important topic, and the way that they have organized this mini-series really provides a beautiful range of uh, the economic activities of ancient human societies and it gives us a lot to think about. So thank you for setting this up and I'm very honored to uh, be able to participate in it. Today what I want to talk about is uh, really I'll be covering three topics. One is I'll be talking about a kind of system that you can call mixed farming. And then I'm going to go from there to talking about the ways that archaeologists reconstruct ancient farming systems and herding systems. And then at the very end, I'll talk a little bit about how those farming and herding systems change with the development of civilization. Now, Terry, in her introduction, already mentioned that uh, working definition of what an economy is, that it's basically the social organization of production, exchange, and consumption. So economies are ultimately cultural things. That if you think of the term subsistence, subsistence basically means food. But once you talk about how humans organize producing and exchanging and consuming food, there are so many different choices involved in that. There are so many different ways to organize that that it really is a cultural product. So by looking at ancient economies, it's a very powerful way to try to understand how ancient cultures work. I think we can say that there are four main forms of economic activity that were characteristic of ancient societies. And in one way or another, all of them, or some aspect of all of them, is covered by this uh, mini-series. The first two are farming and herding. The third is craft production. And the fourth is trade and exchange, or distribution, how goods get from, from the producers to the consumers. And we'll have talks about markets and palace economies, and um, that's subsumed there. But I would have to say that of all of those forms of economic activity, farming and herding are the most basic and the most important, and for obvious reasons. Subsistence farming is absolutely fundamental to survival. It's what we eat, and yet it is so much more that than that. When we realize that the subsistence economy is a cultural product, we have to realize those very acts of subsistence and the production of subsistence things changes markedly as society develops. So farming and herding are not only essential for our survival, but they also form the basis of surplus, in other words, producing extra beyond your own consumption needs. And those surpluses became the main forms of wealth that enabled complex civilizations to develop. That the urban civilizations of the ancient Near East, or anywhere for that matter, could not exist without that economic base of farming and herding. Or it, it's say, I would say it's impossible 
to overestimate its importance. Food is life and food is wealth. It's both of those things and it's fascinating for archaeologists to study the uh, interplay between those two things. So humans and human ancestors lived by hunting and gathering for 99% of our past. Food production, a way of life based on domesticated plants and animals, was only invented about 10,000 years ago in the Neolithic period. It happened by stages, and those stages are actually very important because they tell us something. This shows you um, a map of what uh, James Breasted called the Fertile Crescent, and it's the area where uh, agriculture um, and uh, food production first developed. So the earliest domestication of plants and animals took place in this arc, this crescent that extends from southern Israel up through uh, Jordan, uh, the West Bank, Syria, Lebanon, southeast Turkey, and down into Iraq and Iran. This process happened by stages. At the end of the Ice Age, the people who had been mobile hunter-gatherers in the Near East um, changed their way of life completely. And the climate warmed up at the end of the Ice Age, an amazing thing happened. There was a spread of vegetation, of plant life, all across the Near East. It had been cold and dry during the Ice Age, but during the Holocene it became warm and wetter. And in those optimum climatic conditions, plant communities, and especially things like wild wheat and wild cereals spread all over the place. So what happened? At that point, and it's roughly 10,000 BC, the hunter-gatherers started to settle down next to those very rich areas of wild wheat and wild barley. There was so much wild wheat that um, an agronomist named Jack Harlan from the um, University of Illinois, I believe, um, did an experiment. He made a little sickle with flint blades and he went to a hillside in southeast Turkey and he just wanted to see how much grain can I harvest in a couple of hours. In his own calculations, he figured that a family of five in two weeks could harvest enough wild wheat to feed themselves for an entire year. That's how rich things were at the, uh, in these stands of wild wheat. So it's only natural then that people would have settled down next to those rich plant resources. Over time, um, their population grew and a series of environmental stresses took place that led to the development of domestication. And I'm not really gonna go into that today. That's a, a fairly long technical thing. So the first stage of the Neolithic Revolution is when people domesticated plants, and a, uh, domesticated plants, just plants. They domesticated wheat, barley, um, and that is the origin of the Neolithic Revolution. First village life and then the domestication of cereals. But those first villages of the pre-pottery Neolithic A are actually few and far between. We don't know of a lot of them. They were small. One of them is at the very bottom of Jericho, for instance. But there are not a lot of them. It wasn't until the pre-pottery Neolithic B, about 7,300 years, so it's about 1,000 years later, that they domesticate animals as well, sheep and goat and later cattle and pigs. And that is when things really take off. Population grows very markedly, and most importantly, once you combine domesticated plants and domesticated animals, you had an economic system that was incredibly productive and durable. And so PPNB villages spread all over the Near East. Archaeologists know of hundreds of PPNB villages everywhere from southern Jordan all the way across up through uh, Syria, Anatolia, and down into um, Iraq and Iran. So there was something very, very special about that particular combination of domesticated plants and domesticated animals, and that's the system that we call mixed farming. <laughs>
I put this guy in here just to remind me to tell you that we can monitor this transition as it is happening. That early domestication, or that early focus on wild wheat and barley leading to domestication. This is a burial of a guy from the Natufian uh, culture and period. That's those first hunter-gatherers who settled down next to these very rich wild wheat resources. One of the biggest things that you see when you look at the, um, the teeth of, neo, of Natufian burials is they start to get lots of cavities. That um, the increased amount of starch in their diet, it got, you know, gets caught in their teeth, and I'm sorry to say that Natufians did not floss. And so there's a very high rate of tooth decay among Natufians, and it's connected um, the, the hidden cost of, um, of uh, a focus on cereals. So we can already see the focus on cereals leading to domestication. And um, as I, I mentioned, these are the earliest domesticates. It's both cereals, wheat and barley, and legumes, chickpeas, lentils, peas, and vetch. Um, so when you combine cereals and legumes, the legumes um, have um, uh, various amino acids, especially lysine, so you get a complete protein when you, um, when you combine them, so it's very, very good for you. And uh, the way I remember what these earliest domesticates are is it's basically all the ingredients in a falafel sandwich. <laughs> and then I just wanted the excuse to show this guy, but these are the, um, the four main early domesticated animals. So those plants that I just showed you and those animals that I just showed you, they are the crucial components that make up a mixed farming system. And it is a linked, integrated system. Okay, let's talk about poop. Um, dung is actually an extremely important part of this mix of goods because a mixed farming system has a real set of synergies in it. The animals, the domesticated animals, are fed by the crops that are raised, and they graze on the stubble in the fields after the harvest. While they're grazing on the stubble in the fields, their manure fertilizes those fields as well. That fertilizer, uh, dung fertilizer, can be collected and mixed with ash and spread out over a field. A lot of times they'll also burn the fields, and burning helps speed up the release of nitrogen into the soil. So the animals and the crops are enriching each other. Um, I also want to emphasize that uh, this is, these are some pictures I took in the village where I was living when we were uh, doing my dissertation work. They're corrals next to the houses. At the end of the winter, they take out these enormous pieces of packed dung. They make uh, molded dung cakes that are extremely important as a source of fuel. Um, and any of you who've traveled in the Near East will see everywhere, in every village, a huge pile next to each house of these dung cakes that are uh, used as a very efficient um, fuel. And Dung fuel became more and more important as the Neolithic people started burning up all the forests and brushwood around them. They were clearing forests to make agricultural fields. They were using large amounts of fuel all the time. Once they developed metallurgy, the amount of fuel and uh, wood and charcoal they were burning just to smelt metals was also enormous. So basically, we can see a very quick process of deforestation in the Near East and dung fuel became the fuel of choice afterwards. It actually burns very cleanly and um, uh, consistently, so it's really good in things like pottery production as well. What I'm trying to show you is all of these things are interconnected, that uh, the farming, the herding, the fuel use, it's all connected. Now, so I've mentioned that those are two advantages of a mixed farming system. But a third one is something that should be familiar to all of us in a time of recession, and that is the value of diversifying your portfolio. That 
the crops and the animals are not subject to the same risks. So that if your crops fail, you always have your animals as an extremely important source of uh, nutrition and protein, either from meat or from the dairy products that they produce. I should mention also that the animals are also plow animals that are helping cultivate your fields. So it is, that's another aspect of the interconnections. But by having both the, um, uh, the animal option and the crop option, people could survive very hard times like drought. You can't move your fields to where the water is, but you can move your animals to where water is if you're not getting rainfall in, in your own uh, village. So taken together then, the, the incredible resilience of a mixed farming economy made it the case that um, these systems were able to last for over 9,000 years and they are still the fundamental building block of life in the Middle East. Not only are they resilient, but they're highly adaptable so that the village, this mixed farming village way of life was characteristic of the Neolithic, but also the development of urban civilizations. Now, the way people lived their lives in those mixed farming villages certainly changed. The economic strategies of their herding and farming systems also change, but the fundamental idea of the mixed farming village has absolutely continued and is still the basic building block of life. And that's pretty amazing as a, um, a, a uh, cultural economic invention. So now I'd like to, um, to talk about how we look as archaeologists how we study ancient farming systems. And what's nice is that there are a variety of different pathways in, ways that we can learn about uh, these farming systems. One of the, the nicest ones is artistic representations of agricultural activities. And um, uh, we're very fortunate in having highly detailed Egyptian tomb paintings that show every stage of uh, agricultural, the agricultural cycle. So here you see a man plowing his field. Here you see them um, breaking up the, the earth clods and hoeing it and doing some land clearing. This is deforestation. They've admitted it. Um, here we see look, these men carrying sickles to harvest the crops. Here they're harvesting and collecting the crop in large baskets. And here they're scooping it out, measuring it out for delivery. And here, what they're doing is they are uh, winnowing the crop. And winnowing, of course, is when, well, you thresh it first, which means you chop up the grains. What you're trying to do is separate the seeds from the outer casings of them. And first you thresh, and then you winnow, which is, you, you, you can see it at the very top, these people, it looks like they're raising their hands in the air, and you see the stuff falling down in the middle? They're tossing the uh, threshed wheat up in the air. The wind blows the chaff away, because the chaff is very light, and the seeds fall down. So that's how you separate the wheat from the chaff um, in the farming system. That's the origin of the metaphor. Uh, there's some beautiful paintings of, uh, of uh, farmers plowing, and you get very detailed technical knowledge of how these plows worked. Um, they're very different from the medieval system. The medieval system is uh, called a moldboard plow, which actually turns the ground over, turns the soil over. The ancient Middle Eastern plow is what we call an ard plow, which essentially is um, a pointed stick that is running through the ground digging a furrow, but it's not actually turning the soil over. That's the difference. So it's a little more labor intensive. I'm showing you this because it's a really nice parallel in Egyptian tomb painting. This is a Mesopotamian cylinder seal impression, also of a plowing scene. You'll notice they're both working with a yoked pair of oxen uh, pulling the plow. But the cool thing here is this little element. See, we see that little funnel there and that tube? That's a cedar plow. 
The Mesopotamians had developed this technology where you basically dump the seed in. You see a man's hand is right on the far there. He's pouring barley seed into, the, into that top funnel part and it's dropping down right behind the point of the plow. So the plow digs the furrow and as long as you keep moving, you're getting this constant dropping of um, barley grains into your furrow. Very, very accurately, very um, uh, cleverly avoiding any kind of waste. So the artistic evidence gives us all kinds of really neat insights into the way that uh, these farming systems work. We also have a variety of uh, textual evidence for how uh, ancient farming systems worked. Uh, this is um, a tablet showing, it's a map showing you the canals and the, um, the irrigation system uh, in an area right near the Euphrates River in Babylonia. And one of the real amazing discoveries of the 1950s uh, came at, at Nippur in the Joint uh, Oriental Institute and University of Chicago, I'm sorry, Joint Oriental Institute and University of Pennsylvania excavations at the very important site of Nippur in South Central Mesopotamia. And many of you will have heard of it because this is the site where Professor Gibson excavated for many years until the outbreak of the Gulf War and he's publishing it now. This was the religious capital of Mesopotamia. It's a very, very important city. And what they found in the early 50s was this little tablet, which turned out to be a farmer's almanac from about 1700 BC, which um, uh, with apologies to Jim Sopranos, is a thousand years older than uh, Hesiod's works and days. Until this was found, Hesiod had pride of place as the world's oldest known farmer's almanac. But this one is wonderful. It's very detailed instructions to a farmer on how to irrigate his field, how deep the water should be, what to watch out for when he's irrigating the field, um, and then how to plant it, how, deeply the, um, how deep the uh, furrow should be. And he has all this, this stuff about make sure your workmen don't slack off. You're really going to have to stand over them with a whip. And there, there are all kinds of management hints in there as well. But my favorite part of it is that you have to say a prayer to the goddess of field mice and vermin um, when, uh, on the day that the seed breaks through the ground in order to make sure that um, the seed, field mice and vermin don't, uh, don't harm the field. And then you also, it also gives you very good advice about when is the exact right time to harvest, how to thresh, how to winnow. It's a really remarkable document, and it gives a richness of information. It's an example of how amazing a source of information it is when we can draw on the textual record and the artistic record and the archaeological record to understand ancient farming. Um, we, in the absence of textual data, and when you're dealing with village economies, a lot of the people, in fact, almost all the people living in the villages were not literate, so we really have to rely very heavily on archaeological information, and there's a lot we can do. And so I wanted to just quickly run through some of the methods archaeologists use to try and understand ancient agriculture. Some of the best evidence comes from these things, which are sickle blades. This is a gorgeous one. It's um, from that Natufian period, and it was actually used to harvest wild grain. It would have been held in, this is a small one held in the hand, uh, and it's the head, it's a piece of bone, and the head is carved in the shape of a deer or a gazelle. And then these pieces of flint were set into the bone, and it was held in the hand and used to, to harvest. And what you can see here is polish on the edge of the sickle. And that is called silica gloss or sickle sheen. And that is a byproduct of um, there's silica inside every plant. If you ask yourself, why does the stalk of a plant stand upright? It's because there are little pieces, hun actual hunks of silica called phytoliths, which means plant rocks, um, that are inside the stalks of the plant. And when you harvest the plant, the silica from those phytoliths polishes the, the, um, the stone, the sickle blades, and amazingly, 
the heat, it's very hot when you do that at that point of contact. And so phytoliths often get stuck to the sickle blades themselves, can be extracted from them, and archaeobotanists can identify from the shape of the phytoliths what plant was being harvested. So finding the sickle blades, we know that they were farming. If you have enough grant money, you can <laughs> extract the phytoliths and figure out from the stone tools what they were farming. I find that amazing. Um, and sickle blades can be very useful. I've been, uh, I was excavating an Uruk Mesopotamian trading colony and I wanted to find out were these people producing their own food or were they so rich and powerful that they were having the local people deliver food to them. And in fact, we found tons of sickle blades. That black stuff is bitumen. They were hafted in bitumen. Uh, they have sickle gloss on them. And those were in the Uruk part of the settlement. So we know those people, the colonists themselves, were farming. So you get real insights by looking at the artifactual distributions of these things. Now, we talked about textual evidence, we talked about the actual tools used in harvesting, but one of the main forms of evidence to reconstruct um, ancient farming system is, is looking at the actual remains of the plants themselves. And one way that this is done uh, is through what's called flotation sampling, and it's a very, very simple thing. Uh, the idea is that you take soil samples as you're excavating, especially when you see carbonized or burnt charcoal in the, the soil that you're digging up. Now, you dump it into this bucket, this barrel, which actually has a shower head in it sticking up. And see how the water is being agitated? The water is being frothed up by this shower head that's sticking up. So as the soil is dumped into the water, the water is frothing up, the pieces of charcoal, the burnt seeds and burnt charcoal, float to the top. They flow off through this little channel and are captured in this uh, cheesecloth, which is suspended in an open bottom bucket. And here's a close-up of it. And you can see all the little pieces of seeds and charcoal are being gathered there. And we, that's called the light fraction of flotation. We, you can see it's labeled with, so we know exactly what layer and feature or oven or pit it's come from. And then when it dries, we're able to open it up and you can see it's all charcoal and seeds and plant remains. You can examine them under a microscope. This is in particular, um, these are grape pits or grape seeds that were found through flotation. So it's a very simple idea but it really gives you very valuable results and very important insights into the, how the farming, what people were farming. Another um, way that uh, people are able to look directly at plant remains is by looking at pollen, either from archaeological sites directly or from the fields and marshes around those sites. And here uh, we see um, a guy coring, uh, using an auger to core into the the uh, moist soil near an archaeological site in, um, where I worked in um, southeast New Mexico. And uh, this is the range of the different pollen types. It's a beautiful picture. It looks very unworldly. But you can see how the pollen, this is what's causing your allergies. Um, you can see how the pollen is easily identifiable to the different species. So that's really valuable because it tells you what crops people were raising but pollen is blown around by the wind, so it also tells you a lot about the ancient climate in that area. Like you can look at what's the ratio of tree pollen to grass pollen, and you can tell is it an open area or a forested area. Very useful, uh, very important direct evidence about farming systems. Now, it's crucial to make a distinction. We talk about farming, and you know farming is a big, big term. In the Middle East, there are two kinds of farming. You can really divide the Near East up this way. One is called dry farming and the other is irrigation. And it all depends on water. This is a rainfall map of the Near East. Remember I showed you the Fertile Crescent at the beginning of my talk? Well, oops. How bad eye hand coordination. See how the Fertile Crescent exactly maps onto the rainfall pattern. 
that these are areas where there is enough rainfall to support agriculture without needing any help. Okay? And as it turns out, there's a magic number, and that number is about 250. If you have 250 millimeters of rainfall every year, reliably, you have enough for agriculture in this dry farming system. So where does dry farming characterize the agricultural systems? In the southern Levant, Israel, the West Bank, and Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, southeast Turkey, the uh, slopes of the Zagros in northern Iraq, and in western Iran. All of those are dry farming zones. Mesopotamia and Egypt are in irrigation zones. And it hasn't uh, escaped people's notice that the world's first really major civilizations arose in areas characterized by irrigation. Now, why should that be? That's been a huge problem in the social sciences. Um, some people, a man named Carl Wittfogel, had suggested, well, managing irrigation requires a bureaucracy, and once you have a bureaucracy, that very quickly leads to the emergence of the state. And that's been critiqued very extensively, in fact, by some very important uh, work by cultural anthropologists um, at the University of Chicago, who, who showed that, in fact, you can manage irrigation systems without bureaucracy and bureaucracy seems to come after the state and not really precede it. So irrigation, that doesn't seem to explain that link between irrigation and these high civilizations. It's a much more direct link. I mean, I'm, uh, I would go with Occam's razor that you should always prefer the simplest explanation. The fact is, irrigation agriculture produces twice the yields of rain-fed agriculture. And it does require many more inputs of labor and capital because you have to build the canals. You have to have a labor force that will build them and a labor force that will maintain them and, of course, people to harvest the crops. So it's a lot of labor and capital, but you get these enormous yields. Uh, when Herodotus visited um, uh, Babylonia in the 5th uh, the, uh, uh, century, he was astounded at the wealth of uh, of, of the productivity of irrigation agriculture. So if we say that food was not just life, food was wealth, you could produce twice as much wealth with irrigation agriculture, even though you had to work pretty hard to do it. Of course, the trick is to get other people to do the work, and then you get the grain. So that's the distinction then, the dry farming zone. In, in, uh, this is in the Habur Plains in northeast Syria. That's the border with Turkey, and those are the mountains of eastern Turkey. And this is the irrigation zone, where it's less than 250 millimeters of annual rainfall. This is the, uh, the Nile Valley uh, in Egypt. But that's a fundamental distinction that really divides up the Near East. Um, now, what's neat is that there are different ways of doing the archaeology of agriculture in the dry farming zone and in the irrigation zone. The dry farming zone, they're just plowing. They don't have all these huge agricultural installations, right? Like irrigation canals and things like that. So how do you look at the agricultural system in the dry farming zone? I'm very proud to say that people at the University of Chicago, especially Tony Wilkinson and students of his like uh, Jason Orr and Carrie Fritz, have done a huge amount in developing a way to work with this stuff. It all boils down to a dinner party in Washington when former director of the OI, Robert McCormick Adams, who was secretary of the Smithsonian, happened to be seated next to the head of the CIA. Uh, it was uh, Wolseley at the time. And they're talking, and uh, they're talking about this top secret, or what used to be top secret, project called Keyhole, which was a satellite uh, the, called the Corona satellite that produced unbelievably accurate, very, very detailed pictures, actual photographs all across the Middle East in the late 60s and early 70s is when they were flying those missions. And it, it's like, a, well, the spy novels in this case were based on fact. The satellite would take the pictures, it would eject the film out, 
It would drop out in a parachute. And this is a picture of a plane, actually. See, it has this little sky hook, this U-shaped sky hook. It would snag the parachute with the film. And they'd bring it back to, um, I think it's right outside of Baltimore, where it's the, the Puzzle Palace, the National Security Agency, and they would um, work with this film. So all of this was done in the 60s and 70s and got incredibly detailed pictures, coverage of the entire Near East. By the mid-90s, when this dinner party took place, this data was totally obsolete. So Robert Adams was a man who'd been using remote sensing for years trying to understand ancient Mesopotamia. So he said to Wolseley, you know, the head of the CIA, you really should declassify this stuff. You don't need it anymore, and it would be really valuable for researchers. And Wolseley, I maybe he'd had a, one Merlot too many, he said, OK, why not? They declassified the images. We now, in our camel lab upstairs, we have one of the largest archives of these declassified satellite images. The data they give is tremendously valuable. Why? Not just because they're very detailed aerial photographs, but they were taken at a point in time before agriculture in the Middle East was mechanized. Now, they have plowed very, very deeply. They have uh, just totally mucked about the landscape. These corona images give us views of, of the landscape at a moment in time before industrialized agriculture took place. And because of that, there are many very, very fragile features of the landscape that still survive. And this is a picture of Tel Brak in northeast Syria. And what you can see radiating out from it are these lines that are called hollow ways. They're the remains of ancient tracks or pathways. What are they? Notice how they fork out. There's, um, there's one of those forks. There, that's much better. Um, they're very hard to see, virtually impossible to see on the ground. This is a great thing where it had rained, so you can see the rain gathering. There's the site. This is the site called Tel Ohawa. And you can see the water in the hollow way leading right back to the town. You almost never would be able to see that on the ground. But in the satellite imagery, you can see it. So what those are is the pathways that people took when they were leading their animals out to pasture and when they were going out to the fields to work them. And just by going back and forth the same way every day, they wore these paths in the ground. Those paths survived. These are Bronze Age systems dating to 2500 BC. 4,500 years later, those fragile things still survive, and it's only in the last 20 years that they've gotten mucked up. So these corona images and Mr. Wolseley's couple of Merlots, too many, have been responsible for our having a total revolution in our understanding of ancient agriculture in the Middle East. So he, Tony Wilkinson and his um, colleagues started mapping. First, they mapped where all the sites were. This is Hamukar, by the way, one of our Oriental Institute excavations that Clemens Reichel is directing. You can map where the sites are, then map the hollow ways. And what you see is patterning, very clear patterning. You see how each site has, it looks like a starburst of radiating hollow ways leading out from it. And where the hollow ways end, that tells you that's the limit of their field system. So you can see how much land did they actually farm around the settlement. That's something you'd never be able to figure out otherwise. Even if you had texts and tablets, those texts usually only record land that belongs to the king or the temple. They don't show you the totality of it. But these hollow ways don't lie. They show you the full extent of the system. So you can measure outward. There's one city and its surroundings. Another one, another one, another one. And then cutting across it is yet another system of hollow ways. And those are roads that connected the different cities across. So because we have these corona satellite images, we can reconstruct an entire landscape of agriculture during the Bronze Age in this dry farming system where really the traces of the farming itself are very hard to find. But what we can find is the path that led to the fields, and that helps us reconstruct them. Now, in the irrigation zone in Mesopotamia and Egypt, we have much more to go on. In Mesopotamia proper, uh, Robert Adams was able to map the incredibly elaborate irrigation canal networks that crisscrossed 
the southern alluvium. And this is a little diagram from a book by Nicholas Postgate about ancient Mesopotamia, and it shows you how elaborate this system was. It's first you have, this is a cross section, there's the river, this is the levee, you know, the heaped up earth, on the raised earth on either side of the river, and then a downslope down to a swamp at the other end. So you have the river, and then a feeder canal that comes off the river, and then a second canal, and then tiny canals that go into the fields, and then the water drains out of those fields into the marshland, and of course you graze your animals in the marshland at the bottom of the system. Very, very elaborate, incredible engine for the production of wealth. But there is a downside, and that hidden cost of irrigation is salinization. And this is some very important work that McGuire Gibson and other people have done. Um, if you over-irrigate, something really bad happens. First of all, as we know, it's incredibly hot in places like Mesopotamia, so the water evaporates, leaving the salts behind. If you over-irrigate, the water table rises, you're bringing water up to the surface, the water is wasted by evaporation, and it leaves the salt behind. And that's no joke. This, the, you can actually see these crusts of salt next to the canals. And here, you can see an entire irrigation canal with the salt, and the whole landscape has been abandoned. So southern Sumer is now a desert where it was once paradise. And it's because, not only, but in a significant measure, because of over-irrigation. So, archaeologists can see those irrigation canals, and as I was showing you in that last slide, um, we can map entire networks of the irrigation system. But there are many different kinds of irrigation farming systems in the Middle East, and I think one of the coolest ones deals with this problem of evaporation. If the water is flowing in an open canal, it, you will lose more than half of it by the time it reaches the village, okay? And if water is scarce to begin with, you want to be careful. The Persians, in the time of the Persian Empire, invented what has got to be the coolest irrigation technology, no, the second coolest irrigation technology around, and it's something called a kanat, which is similar to our word canal. Um, what they, the idea is this, if you have a village down here, the mountains here, the aquifer, the underground water, is higher up next to the mountains. So they, you dig a well straight down, and then underground you dig a horizontal mine shaft like that. Every so often you have to dig holes for, to get rid of the soil and for maintenance. And that's what you're seeing on the surface. It looks like bomb craters, but those are the vent holes, the openings of these holes for maintenance. So the water flows out of that aquifer and then eventually surfaces right next to the fields. So it's protected from evaporation for almost all of its journey. Now, this is, it's a great schematic, but you can actually see that on the ground in this aerial picture. These are near Firuzabad in Iran. Here's one of those kanats. Now watch what happens. It goes like this, up, takes a turn. You can follow it exactly from the, the little pock marks. That's the point where it emerges. See, that's where it comes, reaches the surface, then it's a canal for a short distance on the surface, and then it gets to the fields. What an amazing system. And archaeologically, of course, if you fly over Iran, those of you who have visited there, or if you're planning on going, really look out the window, you'll see the entire landscapes covered with these long lines of these little holes that are the remnants of uh, Kanat systems. So I think that's uh, pretty neat. But my, my nomination for one of the coolest um, irrigation systems is um, one in uh, the Negev in southern Israel. The Negev is a very inhospitable place, um, and uh, I figure that sand viper would encapsulate some of it. Very, very harsh. Remember we talked about how you need 250 millimeters of rainfall for farming? We're talking about an area with 150, 25 millimeters a year, not a lot. But here's the thing. 
in this part of the Negev, it's 100 millimeters. It's not nearly enough, you would think, for dry farming. There was a whole series of small cities and villages and farms in the time of the Nabataeans, the people who built Petra, and in Byzantine times. That's an example. This is a place called Avdat. So what was going on? How could they live there? There's not a lot of rainfall, but when it falls, it all falls at once in these massive flash floods. Here you can see the flood drying out, and then it gets to look like that again. So there is rainfall, but almost all of it washes away. Now why does it wash away? It washes away because of loose soil. This is loose soil, like in northern China in the Yellow River uh, Valley. Loose soil has this funny characteristic. When the grains get wet, they swell up and they form like this sheet, this impermeable sheet. It's as if you spread plastic. So any rain that falls on it will just zoom right across and as a flash flood and will be gone. What, it, what happened was in the 50s and early 60s, um, a group of archaeologists and agronomists in Israel started looking at aerial photographs and they found that almost every little dry wadi, a seasonal water course, had all of these terraces built in it. And they started, they decided, let's go and look at these things and see how they work. And now what are you looking at? This is the, the water course. What they found is all across the water course were these little terrace walls, okay? This is upstream, this is downstream. But look at the hillsides. That's what I want to point out to you. See all these lines? Those are walls. And see these things, these pimples? Those are piles of rocks. What the farmers did was, their principle was, if we save every drop of rainfall and slow it down, it'll penetrate the soil and we'll be able to farm. So the first thing they did was they cleared the hillsides of all the rocks so there'd be a very clean surface of this loose soil for, to catch the water and shoot it down. Then they built these diversion walls. Each wall channels every drop of rainfall in this entire area into one little walled terraced field. So each terraced field has its own, from each side of the river, um, of the water course, it's collecting every drop of rainfall that fell in there. And that is enough to support raising crops. So these guys figured, all right, let's see if we can reconstruct these things and see how they work. So they went to a place um, near Avdat in that part of the Negev, and they rebuilt one of the systems. In the foreground, you can see the ancient terraces that have not been reconstructed in the background where they sort of fixed up some of the terraces. Here you can see some of the traces of those walls that channel the water down. You can see it here, you can see them also up here. And here's where the farmstead was on the top of the hill. Oops, sorry. So look at the amount of rainfall that gets collected in these things. It's astounding. And then they're harvesting peaches and full fields of, of wheat in a place that gets 100 millimeters of rainfall a year. Every drop of rain came from the sky. It wasn't river irrigation. But that's an astounding accomplishment of ancient people and a very nice bit of archaeology to have figured out how it worked and reconstructed it. OK, so that's how farming systems work. I want to very briefly go through herding systems because I know I'm really out of time here. I talked way too much, and I apologize for that. Herding systems, the same thing. We can reconstruct a lot of what was going on through artistic representations. Here are people making uh, straining yogurt. This is the alu bade milking freeze. We have figurines of the herded animals. This is from my excavations at Tel Zedan. It's a very attractive sheep. Um, we can find ancient corrals. Uh, this is one that uh, Tony Wilkinson and I found, and the sherds associated with it date to the early Bronze Age. Uh, but most of all, we rely on the actual animal bones that we dig up at these sites to reconstruct the ancient uh, herding economies. And uh, this is the site of Gritala, an early Bronze Age village in southeast Turkey, where I studied the animal bones. And you can the neat thing about animal bones is that depending on what, re what purpose you're raising the animals for, you'll want to have a different herd structure. So for instance, if you're raising animals 
for dairy production, you know you want mostly females. And in a, uh, to, if you're going to focus on dairy production, you'll kill off all the males very young, and your adult herd will be almost all females. That's just logic, right? Uh, if you're raising them just for meat, it doesn't really matter, male or female. You wait until the animal reaches its full size, and then you kill them off, and you keep some as breeding stock. If you're raising them for wool, it really doesn't matter. Males are okay. And if you're, um, uh, if you're doing wool production, what you do is you castrate the males. That's what weathers are, is castrated males. And they are known to produce a particularly fluffy fiber. So that uh, wool production, you'll, have, you'll keep the animals around to a very advanced age, and the adults will be 50% male, 50% female. So if you can figure out the ages of the animals and their sexes, you can reconstruct what people were hurting the animals for, what products they were trying to get. Um, so I looked at the ages when they killed the animals, and there was a big peak at about a year, and then most of, you know, most of them survived, and then a second peak at about eight, which is when the female's reproductive powers start to fade. And what I did was I tried to compare it to the expectations of what, would, what should the, the age profile of the herd look like under those different production strategies. So this is uh, meat production. It's a beautiful uh, tomb model, a wooden model of butchering an animal. And you can see the, the flint knife and at uh, the carotid artery right there. This is in our Egyptian gallery. And I found that the black curve is what I found at Gritala and the dotted lines are what you'd expect under meat production, and it's very, very close. So they're producing meat and eating it in the village. I compared it to dairy production, where you'd kill off all of the, almost all of the males very young, and it didn't match it at all. I compared it to wool production, uh, and again, this is the profile in wool production, and this is what I had at Gritala. Again, it was very different. So the upshot, uh, oh, another thing is you can see what it, the pattern would look like if the village was supplying animals to the city. And the suppliers would have the very young animals and the very old animals. The consumers in the city would have the prime-aged animals. So the city and the village would be complements. And if you put them together, you'd have a complete profile. Um, but each half would look very different. And Gritala didn't fit either one of them. So what, putting that together, what it meant was that this village of Gritala, even though it was a farming village connected with the city, was largely self-sufficient in its animal production, and it wasn't supplying the city. But many other parts of the Near East, more urbanized parts, like southern Mesopotamia, had very elaborate systems where villages were supplying the cities. Here we can see the network of canals and villages around the city of Uruk, and it was very, very elaborate indeed. So when you take it together by combining the artistic evidence, the textual evidence, archaeology, ethnography, satellite imagery, we can put together a remarkably rich picture of how ancient farming economies uh, worked. And we have to thank the god Ninurta for all of that because he is the source of all that great wheat. So I'm sorry if I went a little bit over. Um, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. It's really remarkable. Um, there is a, a neat book, it's kind of hard to find now, by a man named Hans Wolf, W-U-L-F-F, -F, called The Traditional Crafts of Persia. And he has all these pictures of guys actually digging these Kanat tunnels. So they had um, very elaborate sort of, well, they just dug straight down. And then they had these big ceramic rings. I don't know how I could describe it to you. Um, if you think of a, like maybe um, a wash tub, and if you cut off the bottom, so it was open at the top and the bottom, these big ceramic rings that they would then fit down into the canal, into those shafts, to keep them from collapsing inward. 
So they, they needed to have the shafts open so they could periodically muck, out, muck them out. And that, that's why they have that pockmarked look on the surface, because they're scooping the dirt out from them. But it's, it's a very simple technology, these ceramic rings and just digging straight down with fairly simple you know, iron tools, which they had in the time of the Persian Empire. But the end result was this very elaborate system. The financing of it is where it, you see it could only work in a civilization where there's someone very wealthy who can put up the investment in cash and hire the people to do it. Yeah? Okay, so they had that technology to make these ceramic tubes and they could put them in. Tube there. liners, think of them that way. because it's a very arid environment. If they were, um, in a lot of cases, over time, those areas were abandoned, and so the, the, the system lasted. Also, the Kanats have been in use for, in some cases, for thousands of years. So it's only in the last two decades that they've stopped um, making Kanats. So the whole landscape is, is littered with them, and sometimes one system will fill up, silt up, or the water table will drop, and so they'll build another one right next door. So that's why in that picture I showed you, it looked like there were all these radiating lines. Some of them were in use at the same time, some of them weren't. Yeah, were there other questions? Uh, yeah, Mari Lynchon. Mm -hmm. But but it's interesting when you pointed out the distinction between the Rus um, patterns, you had a huge amount of initial labor, but that would have been cheap labor, it would have been the local farmer, as opposed to the organized effort to dig these shafts and line them. Very different kind of wealth structure. It's that's a really good point because what's interesting is um, when you look at um, the put together the aerial photographs of the, that part of the Negev, what you see is lots of small farmsteads, each one on its own little water course where they're just getting every last drop of water out of that water course. But you're right, it must have been organized locally. It's not this kind of massive engineering effort that where all the water goes to one village and the aha or the landlord owns that village and he owns the Kanat it's much more decentralized. I think that's a really good point. And it's a perfect point about how an economy is a cultural product. It's not just food. Yeah, Have you found any evidence of periodic famines uh, during this period where things either environmental factors or just population growth getting in a direction? The short answer is yes. We do have evidence um, remember of that, of that system of the hollow ways in the dry farming zone? The dry farming zone is much more vulnerable to rain, you know, if the rainfall drops, you're really in trouble. In the irrigation zone, you basically have the Tigris and the Euphrates, you're not dependent on rainfall where you are. So what we do know is that at about 2200 BC, there seems to have been a terrible drought that lasted for maybe about 50, almost 100 years, a very long-term drought. And all of those early Bronze Age cities, they were very fragile and they collapsed. The people basically abandoned them, became nomads or moved into villages, but they couldn't support those large groupings of people anymore. So that's one example. We also know from the textual record, periodically it will um, uh, talk about that. Um, we had a, a, a very talented guy named Magnus Waddell, who was our, the head of our research archives, our library for a while, and Magnus was interested in the ecological history of that dry farming zone. So he went and looked at medieval chronicles, which are always great, they have all this good stuff in them. The Aramaic-speaking Syriac people of North Syria had chroniclers in medieval times, and they would say, in this year this happened, this year this happened, and he was able to trace the periodicity of droughts by looking at the medieval chronicles, because they're not gonna lie about that stuff. 
And it was very interesting. You can see it's a very fragile marginal area. So famine was a very real and recurring risk for those people. Yeah, so. I was talking about how much agriculture has changed since they were flying those corona missions in the early 70s. And a big part of it is not just really deep plowing mechanized agriculture, but also gasoline pump irrigation. So that even in that dry farming zone, everyone who could was buying gas pumps and drilling down and getting um, and, and starting to irrigate even in the dry farming zone. And um, what has happened, it's, it's really an underreported kind of ecological disaster in the making. The water table in those areas has dropped by like 30 meters. And when you combine that with there's been a terrible drought in the last couple of years, there are vast areas of North Syria, right near where my project is working, uh, close to the Turkish border, um, where basically the villages, people have moved out of the villages. The villages are almost abandoned, and people have gone to like Saudi Arabia to get work in um, areas outside of agriculture. So yes, they are supplementing it, but it doesn't always work. Yeah, Margaret. Well, obsidian or volcanic glass, and mostly comes from well, a number of sources in central Turkey and eastern Turkey, and they started trading obsidian very early on. So really early in the Neolithic, there's obsidian from, uh, from central Anatolia and from eastern Anatolia in Jericho in these early PPNA, pre pattern Neolithic A levels. Now, what's interesting is they usually didn't use the obsidian for harvesting. It's very, very sharp. It's incredibly sharp. So you want to use it for cutting things, but it's also very brittle. So what you want is something a little less sharp, but very durable for your sickle blades. And that's why flint is better for sickles, but obsidian is better for sort of when you, when you really want something sharp. Hides? Um, for scraping hides, you want flint. For cutting through them, you'd want um, obsidian. So you, people probably had toolkits like that. And what we do see is there are large increases in obsidian trade, but once they started making metal tools, the obsidian trade disappears. So the early Bronze Age is sort of the last gasp of obsidian, because that's when they started making enough of these tools that people said, well, you know, we really don't need to use obsidian anymore. Have I worn you out? Thank you very much.